Be sure you download the note card that goes along with this sermon, and you can print it out, and you can follow along. Fill it in as you follow the sermon. If you like this sermon, want to see more like this, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when other new content is added to this site. We try to add sermons as often as we can. We'll try to add some Bible question and answers that we've done before in the past. Other things we may be adding to this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to follow us on social media, there are links to our social media accounts in the video description below. Now, let's jump into the sermon. Today's reading from God's Word, a very familiar passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. When you get to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, we'll begin in verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the hot. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of his posterity, be joyful, he says. In the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that he will be after him. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1 through 14. Some might say that this life under the sun is simply a series of choices and decisions that define who and what we are as individual. The, in, again, some might say that this life under the sun is simply a series of choices and decisions that define who and what we are as individuals. The preacher poses a question in Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 12 where he says, For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life? which he passes like a shadow. For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? That directs our minds to pondering these choices and decisions and whether or not there is actually a better way of living this life. For who knows what is good for a man? during the few years of his feudal life. He will spend them like a shadow. 
For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? That's what we just read. And this is a good question. Who is it that actually knows what is better for man to do? Does a man have the ability to know such a thing? Jeremiah answered this question in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23. He said, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that is, is not in man who walks to direct his steps. So if man cannot do so, then where can we look to the better way? While Ecclesiastes might not have every single answer to every single question that might be posed by man as to the better way of living. Ecclesiastes 7, 1 through 14 does give the reader some insight into the wisdom of God so that we might understand what is the better way of living life under the sun. Throughout these verses... The preacher presents numerous examples of things that are better than other things. Some of these statements we would probably chalk up to plain old conventional wisdom, common sense. However, some of these things might actually be a little counterintuitive to what we might think is true. Some of these comparisons suggest that things we might think are bad are actually being beneficial to us. They might not make sense to us at first, but hopefully we can dive in and see God's wisdom all throughout this text. So as we work our way through these verses over the next few minutes. I hope that we will all clearly consider the wisdom behind each of these points and why the mind of God dictates that these things are so. God's desire is truly for our betterment in this life. And through the acknowledgement of His superior wisdom, each of us can truly benefit from living the better life under the sun. So let's consider these verses and all the wisdom of God that can help us make better decisions and live better lives. First of all, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and in verse 1, he points out a good reputation is better than precious ointment. Another way of putting that is better than wealth, he tells us. We have probably all seen either in a movie or maybe in, even in real life, a father looking his son in the eyes and reminding him of his last name and how that last name carries with it something special. The point is that our name can either be a point of pride or embarrassment. What do we think of when we hear certain last names? What do you think of when you hear the last name Jordan or Bush or Schwarzenegger, Manning, Mozart? With all these names comes to mind different imageries in our minds. And that is because these names represent certain people and their reputations. When the preacher mentions a good name, I'm convinced he is referring to our reputation. It is better for us to have a good name than to have wealth. Wealth isn't something that we always earn, but as long as we have it, we are wealthy. Our names are not exactly earned, but we can certainly ruin our last name through shameful living. Just because we have the right name doesn't mean that we are free from any responsibilities toward it, especially as Christians. If we wear the name of Christ, we must give every effort to represent it well. The preacher, through the wisdom of God, says that we ought to strive to have a good reputation because it is far more beneficial than wealth. 
Money can only get us so far in this life. But being someone who is godly in their character and in turn has a good reputation can take each of us a long way. Most importantly, our money won't do anything for us when it comes to getting to heaven. But our name, our reputation, who has a lot to say about that? It does. It will only be those people who have good names who are written in the book of life. There will be no buying our way into that book. But we will only be there through righteous and godly living. Luke chapter 10 and verse 20 says, Rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. So a good reputation is better than wealth. Second part of that verse tells us that a good name, that the day of our death is better than the day of our birth. Now, this is certainly one of those instances where we scratch our head and wonder how such a thing could be so. How can the preacher say that dying is better than being born? Is this an absolute statement? To that, I would say no. This is not an absolute statement, but if we live life a certain way, then it absolutely can be true. This life is full of many sorrows that sometimes make life miserable and nearly unbearable. In fact, we know that Job cursed the day of his birth as he was in the pits of misery from the afflictions of Satan. He says in Job chapter 3, and in verse 1, let the day perish on which I was born. However, for those who are faithful to God, we have the hope that this life will only be temporary, and then we will be able to go on and live with God in eternal bliss in heaven. Paul said it extremely well in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. If I am to live in the flesh, he said, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall, uh, shall I choose? I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. He said, convinced of this, I know that I will remain in and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So that in me, you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. When he stated how torn he was between continuing to live in this life with its struggles, but where he could serve the Lord and others, are going to glory to be with Jesus and receive his reward for his faith. You see, may we strive to have this kind of faith and recognize that the day of our death can be a day for rejoicing if we'll continue to faithfully serve God in this life. Then he goes on a similar thought. He says in verse 2 and 3, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. A funeral is better than a party. Much along the same line, that might seem counterintuitive to our thing. The preacher says that a funeral is better than a party of feasting and celebration. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I quite enjoy uh, funerals as much as I do parties. I can't quite enjoy them. I don't think that's the same. So what could the preacher be getting at? How could a funeral possibly be better or maybe even more beneficial than a party? Well, I think the answer lies in the purpose that the funeral can serve. When we are at a party, 
what our mind our minds focused on. I know for me, I tend to be focused simply on what's going on around me, having a good time because parties are a time of escape from negative parts of life and to relax a little bit. There's a place for that, I suppose. But I think the funeral serves as an even bigger, more important role in that it brings us back to reality to remember that this life isn't going to last forever. And at some point, the funeral will be our own. The funeral, he said, is the end of every man. Funerals are opportunities for us to ponder and reflect upon our lives and the way we are using the time that God has given us. For this reason, I think the preacher's words, sorrow is better than laughter, are well stated. When we sorrow, we contemplate life. And it is in that moment that we often seek to make positive changes. Laughter doesn't have to be that same, have that same impact on us. So may we give our strong effort when we are faced with death and funerals to consider our lives, to use the negative parts of life in a beneficial way and to the glory of God. Then in verse 5 and 6, he said, It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This is also vanity. While a little different, but still on the same thought of not exactly being something that we enjoy or appreciate, the preacher goes on to say that the rebuke of a wise man is better and more beneficial to us than the song of praise from a fool. No one likes to be rebuked. No one enjoys being corrected. No one likes to be told they are wrong. Reminds me of Happy Days and Fonzie. Closest he could ever get to saying he was wrong was he'd say, I was, whoa, 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 never could get it out. People are that way. But if that correction is coming from someone who is wise and has our best interest at heart, then can't we appreciate that a lot more? I would certainly think so. On the other hand, we love to be told that we're right. We love to be told that we're the greatest thing since a shirt pocket. But what good does this praise do for us if the praise is coming from some who couldn't find his way out of a paper bag? It truly does us no good. Now, I fully recognize and understand the natural inclination to want to surround ourselves with yes men who will always tell us that we are good, right, and great. But this truly does us no good because sometimes we need to be questioned about what we're doing. Sometimes we need to be asked why we are doing something a certain way. Sometimes we need wise people to tell us that there is a better way. We aren't made stronger and wise by the song of fools, but we are made stronger and wise by those who are strong and wiser who seek to pull us up to where they are. Then he says in verse 7 and 8, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. You might be thinking that we just talked about this with death and funerals, but let me suggest that verse 8 leaves room for more, a more broader application than just with the day of our death. In fact, the end of many things can be found to be much better than the beginning. The, think to some of the great things you've experienced in your life and think about their ending. I think about high school, I think about college, I think about jobs that I've had and such. Often at those points we stop and are, we're saddened that they are finished. A lot of people are depressed at the end of college because there's no more papers to write, there's no more goals to meet, but really 
as life goes on, there's new goals. There's new things to do in life, not necessarily writing papers by a certain deadline, but there are things to do. I think the preacher is trying to show us that these endings are good for us because they give us the opportunity to look back, to learn, and grow. When we reach finish lines, we get to look back and be proud of the fact that we are actually finished with something that we have started. How often do we regret those times where we began something and failed to finish? Those feelings are not enjoyable, but neither are endings at times. However, at the end, we can at least look back and be proud of what we have accomplished. And often those accomplishments didn't come easily. We often go through growing pains and struggles as we seek to accomplish good things in life. Often in the beginning, we regret starting out on these endeavors, but the end brings about relief and fulfillment because we reach the finish line. Oftentimes when moving to a new work, I try to reflect on the work that I am coming from and try to look at some things that I can learn and maybe do different next time and maybe not have some of the problems and some of the struggles that I previously had. In Psalm 126 and verse 5, the psalmist says there, those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. He who goes to and fro weeping and carrying his bag of seed shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. And then, patience is better than arrogance and pride, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, 8, and 9. We just read 8, but look at 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Probably the most clear cut out of this list is what is said by the preacher in verse 8 and 9. We know well that pride is evil and of the devil and will only bring about our destruction. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eye, the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away. Watch that. Underscore that. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We get that pride and arrogance are wrong and that we ought to be patient and wait for things in their good time. But why do we seem to struggle with this so much? I think one reason is because we get so focused on what we want and feel as if we need that we aren't willing to go about things the right way. Instead of planting seeds of the pure gospel, we try to lace the gospel with something that we think makes it sweeter and more attractive to people. When we do such a thing, all we are doing is leading those individuals to destruction. He says in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Anger often appears alongside pride and arrogance because we think that things ought to be a certain way, and when they aren't, then it's time for us to blow up until we get our way. This type of attitude and way of living will only lead to more problems. It will make it evident to others that we are not among the wise, but we are a part of those who are fools. And then verse 10, he says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask. So the present is better than the past. 
There are certainly still many people even today to exclaim that things in our day are so much worse than how things used to be. While there might be some truth to that statement, the preacher seems to indicate that such proclamation does no good at all. In fact, it is not in their wisdom that they say such things, but it's from their foolishness. The truth is that we often focus on how great things used to be while conveniently forgetting the struggles of the past that were as present then as they are now. We are simply wanting to go back and dwell on the best times to avoid what are currently go we're going through. When we allow ourselves to focus so much on the past, we often fail to see the golden opportunities of the present. Even if there are currently difficulties in our life, let's not forget that there are always things in which we can rejoice because we serve a living, merciful God who will strengthen us even in difficulty. James chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Then he says in chapter 7, verse 11, Wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Wisdom is better than wealth. This is now the second time that we have seen where the preacher props up something as being better and greater than wealth. The first time we saw him speaking about a good reputation being better, and now he's saying that wisdom is better as well. Now, this isn't to say that wealth is inherently a bad thing. It can serve as protection in certain ways, as the preacher makes mention in verse 12. But it's still inferior to wisdom and knowledge in our lives. In fact, great wisdom without wealth, without wisdom. Now, let me repeat that. <clears throat> Threshold. In fact, great wisdom without wealth can lead to many problems in our lives. The wise fool can easily find himself in the pit of ruin because of his foolish behavior. And money will only be able to serve as that defense to a certain extent. On the other side, one can be extremely successful in life with knowledge and wisdom alone. The preacher says that knowledge and wisdom preserve the lives of its possessors. Verse 12, the ultimate places where this is the case is in the day of judgment where money and wealth will do not anyone any good, do no one any good at all. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 4, riches, he says, do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Then finally, verses 13 and 14, look at what he says. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made, has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. I often use this passage at a funeral that we're gathered to consider. And that's a good thing to do, good time to consider. But consider any time. Contentment is better than disappointment. God has made the ones as well the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Finally, the preacher closes this section by reminding the reader of the importance of learning contentment in this life. 
As the preacher has already mentioned previously, there are things that God has done that we have no ability to change. What he has set as being so, we have no ability or power to change. Therefore, we have a choice as to how we will approach and react to this life. We can either wallow in our self-pity and be resigned to a miserable life full of nothing but disappointment, or we can accept the blessings of God along with the difficult days. We can choose to be like Job, who was willing to fall down and worship God on the worst day of his life, acknowledging that he is a good God who gives and takes. Look at Job chapter 1 and verse 20. Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground in worship, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Verse 22 says, In all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. <clears throat> Again, even the worst of times we can seek and find the goodness of God, and we ought to be content with that great blessing. So the words of the preacher from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 14, are far-reaching to so many different corners and facets of our life. But might I say that they can be summed up by saying that the better life under the sun is found in humbling ourselves to see and react to this world as God would have us to. Our lives are made so much better when we simply take a breath, consider if what we are doing is being done according to the wisdom of God or the folly of man's foolishness. May each of us take these words to heart so that we can all live better lives under the sun to the glory of our loving and great God. What must I do to be saved? The question asked by the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, we learn that we must hear the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, we learn there that faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God, by the Word of God, some translations say. We're to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Acts 2, verse 36, Peter said, Let all the house of Israel know, therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Paul tells us in Colossians 1, 14, it's in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Confess Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, who has been raised from the dead. Jesus said, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Paul tells us in Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We find repentance, a change of heart, a change of how we live our life is important. Jesus said, I tell you, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Then he asked the question, those 18 on whom the tower in Shalom fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others who lived in Jerusalem? He said, no. 
I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You'll perish like they did. Acts 17, verse 30, the time of this ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Peter, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, tells us repentance is important, but along coupled in that phrase with a conjunction, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the salvation there. We learned that baptism is a burial. He said, do you not know all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved. First Peter 3.21, even baptism doth also now save you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then we are to endure to the end. Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Barnabas, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraged them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul tells the young preacher Timothy, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, if you found this video helpful and want to learn more, be sure to download the note card that goes with this lesson, plus a link to our free four-lesson Bible correspondence course. You'll find the link to each in the description below. Thanks for watching or listening. In the meantime, in between time, see you next time. Sherry O. Bob's your uncle.